Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about the work that I've been doing with my really awesome supervisors to reconstruct Australia's climate over the past 100,000 years. So um, this seems like a long time ago, but it actually has some applications for the way we approach our current climate crisis. So I'm going to be talking to you about the arid zone. So this is a photo from Adnyamatnya country in South Australia, which is in the arid zone. So 70% of Australia is classified as either arid or semi-arid. And in these regions, evaporation is really high and there's typically pretty limited rainfall. So um, surface water is really hard to come by. So in these regions, we tend to rely on groundwater resources. So here is just a map of groundwater dependence in Australia. So with the light orange areas is where we use more groundwater than surface water. And then the dark orange is where we have complete or near complete dependence on groundwater resources. So you can see in a lot of regions in Australia where really dependent on groundwater. Uh, but the problem we have is that in a lot of Australia, groundwater recharge rates are currently really low. So we have a situation where across lots of Australia, we have more groundwater extraction than we do have recharge to the groundwater systems. And so a lot of the water that we're actually using is fossil water that entered the groundwater systems a long time ago, but isn't being replenished as quickly as it's being used. So if we want to inform long-term effective groundwater management strategies, we need to know a bit more about the conditions under which these aquifers were originally charged with water. How can we answer this question? Well, with something I'm very passionate about, speleothems. So not everyone may have heard of these, but if you've been to a cave and seen the stalactites and stalagmites, they're speleothems. So they're sedimentary carbonate deposits that grow in limestone caves and they require infiltration of water through the soil and the bedrock and into the cave to be able to grow, which means they're a really good indicator of groundwater infiltration. So um, this is our study site, Mare's Cave on Adyamatnya country, and it's sort of on the boundary between the arid zone and the semi-arid zone. And it contains these really interesting formations. So today it's way too dry for any of the formations to be growing. But the fact that they're present in the cave tells us that at some point in the past, the region was receiving a lot more, a lot more groundwater infiltration than it is today. So these are quite unique formations called pendulites. So they begin as stalactites hanging from the ceiling of the cave with a downwards direction of growth. Then at some point there's an increase in water infiltration, which causes the water table to rise and flood the cave so that the stalactite is submerged in groundwater. From that point forward, calcite is precipitated subaqueously on the existing stalactite surface. So this subaqueously deposited material has a radial growth direction. Then at some point there's a decrease in groundwater recharge, which causes the water table to drop below the cave and there'd be a hiatus in subaqueous speleothem growth. So because of this really unique and really interesting growth mechanism, when we see phases sub of subaqueous growth, this is evidence that there was cave flooding at the time because of higher water table because of more groundwater recharge. And then when we see hiatuses in subaqueous speleothem growth is evidence that there was no cave flooding because there was a lower water table because there was less groundwater recharge. So they're a really useful archive for reconstructing groundwater recharge trends. Uh, so these are the three speleothems that we've worked on so far, MC1901, 2001, and 2002. And you can see it's highlighted in blue, they all have that internal stalactite component and it has that downwards direction of growth. And then they have this external subaqueously deposited material that has a radial growth direction. So if we're able to know the age of this subaqueous material, then we'll know when the water table was high enough to flood the cave and when the region was experiencing more groundwater recharge than it is today. But how do we determine the age of this material? Well, we use uranium thorium dating. So uranium-238 decays to uranium-234, which in turn decays to thorium-230. And uranium-238 and 234 are incorporated in the speleothem in trace amounts as it grows, and they decay at a known rate. So we just have to measure their ratios in the speleothem material using a mass spectrometer like this, uh, inductively coupled plasma multi-collector. And then we plug the results into this equation, and we solve the equation to find the age of the subaqueous material. 
So we've done this over and over and over, and it's taken a long time, but we've accumulated this data set that shows us phases of subaqueous speleothem growth. So we have MC1901 at the top, which sits highest in the cave, so it's only flooded by the most extreme cave flooding events, then MC2001, which is somewhere in the middle, and then MC2002, which sits lowest in the cave, so it's going to be inundated by even relatively minor cave flooding events. So you can see our first phase of subaqueous speleothem growth uh, occurred between about 100 and 88,000 years ago, and then the next between about 73 and 63,000 years ago, and then our longest phase of subaqueous speleothem growth occurred between about 58 and 39,000 years ago. And then since then, we've had relatively minor, short-lived cave flooding events. So we compared our results to incoming solar radiation in summer in the Southern Hemisphere, and incoming solar radiation, because we're lazy, just gets shortened to insulation. So we can see that there's a tendency for subaqueous speleothem growth phases to occur when summer insulation is high in the Southern Hemisphere. So this relationship indicates that potentially subaqueous speleothem growth and groundwater recharge at the site is responsive to tropical rainfall delivery. So I'll quickly try and run through an explanation of this, but if you think about the earth receiving insulation from the sun, more insulation is received at the equator. So this creates a zone of warming and evaporation. So we have rising water laden air masses, low pressure, cloud formation and rainfall. So this is our monsoon region. So in Northern Hemisphere summer, when the Northern Hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, we have the monsoon system sitting north of the equator. And then in Southern Hemisphere summer, when we have the Southern Hemisphere tilted towards the sun, then all of these monsoon systems move into the Southern Hemisphere. So going back to our results, that's why when we see these peaks in Southern Hemisphere um, summer insulation, we can interpret this as evidence that the monsoon belt would have sitting, been sitting further south. And so we have enhanced tropical rainfall delivery across to Southern Australia, more groundwater recharge and subsequent growth of our subaqueous speleothems. So um, it's not just insulation that drives the position of the monsoon belt. I wish it were that simple, but it's a really complicated system. But you can sort of summarize it in that the position of the monsoon belt is somewhat determined by the energy balance between the two hemispheres. So if you have warming in one hemisphere relative to the other, the monsoon belt is going to shift towards the warmer hemisphere. Lucky for us, speleothems can tell us about more than just growth phases. Um, we can also get high resolution records of groundwater recharge intensity as well. So if we go back to our results and we're going to zoom in on this longest phase of subaqueous speleothem growth, and we have some extra results here. So at the top, we have speleothem growth rates, where an um, increase in speleothem growth rate indicates wetter conditions and more infiltration of water. So you can see we have these two pulses where we have an increase in the growth rates and so increase in um, infiltration. Below that, we have speleothem uranium isotopes, where an increase is also indicative of wetter conditions. So we also have these two periods of increasing, showing us that there was more groundwater recharge at the time. And then below that, we have oxygen isotopes from the um, Greenland ice core record, where an increase indicates warming in the Arctic, and then a decrease indicates cooling. So you can see that our two phases of increased groundwater recharge occur while we have cooling in the Arctic. So we can see that when the Northern Hemisphere cools and the Southern Hemisphere is comparatively warmer, then the monsoon belt is drawn further south and we have more tropical rainfall delivery across Australia. So to summarize everything I've gone through so far, most of Australia is arid and in arid regions, surface water is scarce and we tend to rely on groundwater. Um, in some areas, we're completely dependent on groundwater for industry, for food production and for drinking water. But in a lot of Australia, um, the amount of groundwater that we're extracting is actually greater than the amount that is being replenished in the aquifers. So um, a lot of the water that we're using is fossil water. Um, so speleothems fortunately can provide us some insight into um, the history of the, of the recharge of these aquifers, including the timing of groundwater recharge events and the intensity of groundwater recharge. Um, our speleothems from southern Australia show us that aquifer recharge occurred thousands of years ago when Australia's climate system looked very different to what it does today and when it received a lot more tropical rainfall than it does in the present. 
So the speleothem growth rates and uranium isotopes reveal that groundwater recharge intensity increased in response to Arctic cooling, which is unlikely to occur anytime soon. And this drew the monsoon further south and intensified tropical rainfall delivery to southern Australia. So the takeaway message that I'd like to impart on everyone is that groundwater recharge in southern Australia occurred when the Earth's climate system was really different to what it is today. And as anthropogenic climate change um, proceeds, we could experience even less groundwater recharge than we see now. So if we want to prevent depletion of our groundwater reservoirs, we need to be managing them really wisely. And that's it.